I've been listening to Anderson Cooper's podcast, All There Is. Anyone else? Some, just a handful. It's a podcast about grief and loss. Cooper opens the first episode while he is clearing out his mom's apartment. His mom was Gloria Vanderbilt, if you didn't know that. Though his mom's death at age 95 is what prompted the exploration, Cooper was no stranger to grief. His father, Wyatt Cooper, died at age 50 when Cooper was 10. And his older brother, Carter Cooper, committed suicide at age 23 when Anderson was 21. In each episode, he interviews someone who has experienced significant loss, not that every loss is not devastating. The through line of the podcast is this. Is healing possible? And how do you hold the grief and how do you rise from the pit? One of the most moving, painful, growthful, and inspiring parts of my life as a rabbi and really just as a human being is being in conversation with those struggling with these questions and witnessing their search to find a way through it. And I myself am not immune to that struggle. Over the last number of months, I am feeling the intensity of grief in our community, particularly acutely. And the grief I see is not only the grief about tragic death or significant illness, it's grief that comes from mourning a person who is still alive, but who can't be who we need them to be. Or confronting the guilt of who we couldn't be in a given moment. Grief about feeling like a failure as a parent. Grief about loneliness or infertility or purposelessness. Grief about Israel. Grief about the hatred towards the Jewish people. Grief about our deeply broken world. And maybe because of the pandemic and all of the loss associated with it, it seems that there is an abundance of writing and talking about grief. I don't know if you've noticed that. Like The Atlantic, I feel like every other week has an article about grief or other significant papers. The New York Times did a piece about Anderson Cooper's um, podcast, which in some way I think is giving us more permission to sit with this question and talk about it. In last week's parasha, Yaakov ran away from home, fleeing from the wrath of his brother Esav after having stolen the birthright. He stops at a certain place and has that famous dream of a ladder with angels going up and down on it, ascending and descending. And there are many commentaries on what the meaning of that ladder and those angels are. Vayikra Rabbah offers what I think is an astounding interpretation of the dream. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman said, the angels that Yaakov saw in the dream are the ministering angels of the nations of the world. The Holy Blessed One showed Yaakov, saying, here is Babylonia ascending and descending. Here is Medea ascending and descending. Here is Greece ascending and descending. And then he go. God shows the ascent of a dome, which a dome in the tradition is a sav. A sav, Yaakov's brother, it comes to be known as a dome. He lives in the, the kingdom of a dome. A dome is also becomes ultimately Rome. So this is the big bad uh, country uh, or rulership. And he doesn't see that a dome descends. And Yaakov reacts in fear, and God assures him that a dome will eventually descend, even though it takes a while, and actually uses a proof text from this week's Haftarah from Ovadia, assume, asserting the whole Haftarah this Shabbat is Ovadia, the whole book of Ovadia, and it's all about the destruction of a dome, essentially saying Esav is not going to win. 
At the time, Yaakov, our father, feared and says to God, Chas v'chalila, God forbid, just like there was a descent for these nations, there will be a descent for me too. And God says to him, you should also ascend. And what does Yaakov respond? Basically, no thank you. I don't want to ascend because I might descend. While the thrust of this Midrash is to speak of the eventual demise of the nations of the world and the ultimate redemption of the people of Israel, it's really a political Midrash. What calls out most to me is this vulnerable voice of Yaakov saying, I am afraid of that too, that I will descend just like the rest of the nations. He has what some call anticipatory grief about descending, about losing, about failing. And he's not alone in that feeling. Yaakov in many ways articulates the very human fear that we are not always on the up and up. And when we imagine the coming down, it can be extremely paralyzing that we choose not even to go on the up because we can't imagine what it feels like to go down. Yaakov doesn't want the descent. He doesn't want the grief. But ultimately we know isn't it, it isn't up to him. He will ascend and descend. That's the way of all humanity. He will fall in love with Rachel and then be tricked into marrying Leah. He will be prosperous in the house of Lavan, but then he will have to leave. And then in this week's parasha, Vayishlach, he has to pass through the land of Edom, the land of Esav, to make his way home. He has to confront Esav, the brother whom he deceived and ran away from. He doesn't know what lies ahead, and he is afraid of the risk involved. The commentators debate whether he's more afraid he's gonna to have to kill Esav or he's gonna be killed himself. Alone at night, he anticipates the meeting with significant fear. And alone at night, he struggles with an angel's man, it's unclear. And though he is hurt, he is injured, he demands a blessing from this angel man and gets one. Yaakov is transformed, given a new name, Yisrael, and reunites with his estranged brother, Esav. In the Torah, it says, Esav ran to greet him. He embraced him, and falling on his neck, he kissed him, and they wept. It's in some ways like a Hallmark card moment, although the commentators, by the way, don't treat it as such. They each go on their own way, and then the Torah says, Vayavo Yaakov Shalem, Ir Shechem, Asher Be'eretz Kena'an Bevo'u Befatam Aram, Vayichan Et Pnei Ha'ir. Yaakov arrived safe in the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Kena'an, having come thus from Padan Aram, and he encamped before the city. He arrived, says the Torah, Shalem. It's often translated as safe or safely, but we know that word, shalom, shalem, means whole, perfect, unimpaired. Unimpaired in body, says Shabbat Talmud in the Talmud, and Rashi quotes, because he uh, got healthy from his injury. Whole as regards to his possessions, for he was not short of anything, even though he gave much to Esav, he had enough of wealth, and perfect in his knowledge of the Torah, for while he was in Lavan's house, he had not forgotten what he had learned. He was filled with Torah. It's an incredible statement that Yaakov is complete. For all his crookedness, because his name actually means crooked, he has straightened, he has become Yisrael, Yashar, straight. And for, he has been the one that has struggled with God which is another understanding of the name Yisrael, Im Sarita Im Elohim, who has struggled with God. 
He is healed not only physically from his encounter with the angel man, but seemingly spiritually. He has all his needs met, physical, material, and spiritual. The Torah and commentaries spend an inordinate amount of time on Yaakov's journey. He is our forefather, we are his namesake, and the complexity of his character unfolds before our eyes, verse by verse, from the birth until his death. And in this moment in the parasha, he is not only shalem complete, but we see him in all of his completeness. This sense of completeness is, of course, short-lived. He descends once again very quickly, actually two psukim later, two verses later, because his only daughter, Dina, is raped. And the shame and grief that unfolds is right there. It's in the next story, chapter 33. Now Dina, the daughter whom Leah had born to Yaakov, went out to visit the daughters of the land. Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivit, chief of the country, saw her and took her and lay with her and disgraced her. For all the transformation and healing that occurs for Yaakov, Dina is never contemplated as a human being in her own right. She never speaks. Only the shame on her family is considered, not her own pain or trauma or grief. Yaakov is silent, actually, in the face of her experience. Her brothers, Shimon and Levi, are vengeful and violent. And Dina literally disappears, only to be mentioned one more time in the Torah in chapter 46, as part of the list of the names of the family members that go down to Egypt with Yaakov. Her story is inadequate and incomplete because her trauma and grief are not even mentioned, let alone addressed. There is no movement towards healing. Unlike Yaakov, who asks in the Bidrash, what if I descend? We never hear a question of hope for Dina. Might she eventually ascend? Might she heal? Listening to Cooper's podcast, I could feel the power of giving voice to the grief and loss. It was not only cathartic, but healing. I learned how each guest in the way, in some way befriended the loss and looked at it head on and how important it was for others to acknowledge their loss directly. Molly Shannon, the actress, comedian from Saturday Night Live, she had a lot of famous characters way back when. Uh, she was four years old when her mother, baby sister, and cousin were killed in a car crash. She was in the car and her father was at the wheel. After the funeral mass, the priest Father Murray kneeled down and held her hands and looked deep in her eyes as she describes it. And he said, Molly, I know you lost your mother and you lost your sister. It's very sad. That's very hard. And she said, Molly, in telling the story, and I just, the fact that he did that meant so much to me, just that he could acknowledge the loss, the pain. But growing up, few people ever spoke with her again about her grief. There's very little space in the tradition to hear Dina's voice and doubly hard to hold that the rabbis of old actually don't speak to her trauma. She is more often blamed for it. In the newly translated book, Dir Shuni, it's a two-volume set in Hebrew of contemporary midrashim by Israeli women feminists. Um, Rivka Lubitsch, it was just translated and we just had a, uh, a conference here last Sunday with Tamar Bialo, who's the editor of it. Rivka Lubitsch 
has a midrash on Dina. And she writes extraordinarily about the opening verse, Vatetse Dina, and Dina went out to see the daughters of the land. She writes, Dina was a quiet person and had no voice. Why to such an extent? Because the male members of her household did not listen to her and didn't engage in conversation as the sages say, and this is true, <laughs> this is a quote from the tradition, do not engage in excessive conversation with the woman. And that is why she went out to see the daughters of the land. So according to Rivka Lubitsch, Dina went out to see the daughters of the land because no one would talk to her at home. So her desire to leave the house was to actually have someone speak with her and be in conversation with her. She continues in the Midrash, it says, and he took her and lay with her and disgraced her. And what it doesn't say is, and Dina cried out. It is it conceivable, is it conceivable that she did not ask Lubitsch? But it's as if she became a mute. Out of the pain and the shame, she hushed up and fell silent. Dina's silence resounds from one end of the world to the other. It is the scream of the heart. This is, by the way, a play on the notion that Adam could see from one end of the earth to the other in a midrash at the beginning of creation because it was all light. And so in this case, she gives voice to Dina's pain by saying he could see, in some ways, the opposite. He could see from one end of the earth to, a other, to the other as a man with the lights, because the light always shined on him, and he had that power. Conversely, Dina, as a woman who had just been violated so profoundly, um, her scream resounds from one end of the earth to the other. The enormity of what Dina carries is finally articulated. Her grief is liberated through this midrash. Finally, she is heard in her silent scream. It offers her a small measure of healing, perhaps even a small ascent. It's incredible what grief we carry. For sure, some more than others, but no one is protected from the ascents and descents in life. Grief needs to be heard. It needs to be witnessed. It needs to be liberated from the confines of the heart. We are afraid of grief and loss, understandably. And Yaakov so profoundly articulates that in the Midrash. What if I fall? What if I descend? Maybe I will never ascend again. What is so striking about the podcast is that it gives permission to speak about grief and loss and to have discovery in it. When Stephen Colbert was 10, it's, by the way, very interesting that comedy, comedians actually are, they're, they're not all comedians, by the way, there are a number of other people on the podcast interviewed, but it is interesting that it, um, there must be something connected there. Actually, Molly Shannon speaks to that. But Stephen Colbert, if you don't know, was 10, the youngest of 11 children, when his father and two closest brothers in age to him died in a plane crash. He says in the podcast, we think grief is going to shut us down and we'll be sad forever. But if you can share your stories and if you can address your grief through that, as, through that storytelling, as you're saying and hearing from other people, then, he says, then, then it turns the cave into a tunnel. And there's some way to get on the other side it adds oxygen to your life. It doesn't, it doesn't cut you off. It opens you up. And I think people are afraid to talk about grief because they think it's a trap of depression 
or something like that, when in fact, grief is a doorway to another you. Grief is a doorway to another you. Listening to the episodes, I began to feel such a tenderness in all the heaviness, an awakening in the darkness, and an expansiveness in all the ways we tend to shut down amidst pain and tragedy because we are afraid. For me, the story of Yaakov in this week's parasha has been a guiding force in my life as a Jew. As a teenager, I learned the story in, um, in my youth group at this very intense retreat. We studied the story. We talked about struggle with God. It was like very, very formative his imperfection and his wrestling, his search for the blessing and demand of it. He demonstrates what it means to be a religious human being, to have a relationship with God in the struggle. And we are collectively bequeathed that gift because his story is told. In my own experience of loss and grief and fragility, his story is a guiding force. But there are so many untold stories hidden in their sadness and shame, ones that are supposed to and never have a chance to ascend. How will we invite them in? The story of Dina and all those who have been abused or silenced and shamed, even Esav, the perceived enemy, will we give him a voice? Will we open a door to what he actually carries? You and me and all our descents and ascents, I pray that we have the courage to ask, how might I give voice to my grief? And is there a touch of healing to be found? I pray also that we as a community have the openness to hold and witness each other's pain. If you ever go to a Shiva, It's very interesting how people behave in shivot, um, when we used to do them in person more. But often, um, people try to make small talk with the mourner because it's fearful to actually open up and listen to the pain that someone is holding. And, or sometimes we tell our own stories of grief because it's easier to tell our own than listen to the other person's. How might we hold the person who's the mourner in that moment and listen deeply, just like Molly Shannon's priest did? I want to hear your pain. I can take it. I can hold it. How can we as a community have the openness to hold and witness each other's pain and to look each other in the eye in the midst of it and say, I see you? Though our tradition and our people are more open to certain stories, we're preferential to some stories than others. Not only in the Torah, but in life too, in Israel too, in our country too. I hope we have the audacity to Doresh, to really expound. Doresh is is the root of Midrash. To seek out, it really means to expound on all the stories. And Rabbi Nachman teaches very beautifully on the verse from Amos, Dirshuni v'chayu, seek me and live. But he's not, he doesn't always speak about the Dirshuni as speaking, as seeking me, he's talking about drashet, you know. Seek me and live, for wisdom gives life to the one who possesses it. In our grief and in our loss, may we uncover the stories, may we doresh them, may we seek them out, may we tell them and through them, may we find the wisdom to open the door to life. Shabbat Shalom.